uptrends have broken down, lower lows are in, but we still don't want to be short in the hole. We need better trade location at this point, and this week shouldn't be easy. There's a very real possibility that the markets might be dancing on eggshells early on with the anticipation of Nvidia earnings on Wednesday and Jackson Hole Symposium kicking off on Thursday. So eggshells or not, let's build a game plan for the coming weeks worth of trade that's based on logic and not emotion. As always, check out the links listed down below in the description, hit the thumbs up button and subscribe if you have not already done so, and stay tuned until the end of today's show. I've got two additional trade ideas to share with you that you won't want to miss. With that said, let's jump right into the charts. So kicking things off on the SPY weekly time frame, talking about candle structure and location as we always do. For structure this past week, we're certainly looking at a solid red bodied bar with a little bit of an upper wick, a little bit of a lower wick, but certainly nothing substantial in relationship to the size of the overall candle body. We did close fairly weak in the lower third of the weekly range. So overall, sellers do have the upper hand from a structural perspective. If we think about location on the bar to bar count, lower high, as well as a lower low does stack up as a bearish data point as well. In the grand scheme of things, if we just remember back to trend, we know that we've got lows, higher lows, higher lows, higher lows. These are a set of soft higher lows, and that's exactly where we find ourselves in the low of last week's trading range. We do know that we're pulling back from a higher high, so it's reasonable that if the weekly chart is going to remain in a picture-perfect uptrend, that could produce a higher low. However, nothing about the weekly bar structure would suggest that yet. On the daily chart, we would love to see if the buyers can step up here and try to defend the bottom of this area around 432. If that breaks from the weekly perspective, we should be looking at our next target down here, closer to 418, 415, the magic 420 zone that we've been talking about for quite some time. Even if we do rally off of this set of soft higher lows, you've got to think about the real possibility for a head and shoulder, some sort of daily lower high gets set, right? And now we're dealing with a neckline here, and that could produce a stronger weekly trend reversal to get to the monthly higher low at 420. That's a bit of an extended forecast, but it's a very real possibility with the uh, sellers sitting in the driver's seat based on the large red bodied bar. If we take a look at some anchored view apps, do we get any confluence from that perspective? Let's throw them on for the spiders. We're through the AI mania anchored view app. We closed underneath that as of last week. Um, and this is still providing confluence closer to that 420 zone if the market does drop further to try to find that monthly higher low. A couple of interesting Fibonacci perspectives I want to share with you just really um, illustrating the importance of the level we're sort of approaching here around 432, these soft lows, 430, 432 is the precise level. We'll see that in the daily chart in just a second. But 430 is a rough zone, right? That's your 61.8 Fibonacci from the all time high to the October low. But wait, it gets better than that, right? You can come from here up to the local top. There's your 38.2. If this rally is going to be digested in a picture perfect manner for like a weekly bull flag, we hold the 38.2, which is confluence with your 61.8. But wait, it goes one step further than that. You can come from here all the way on up to here, and your 61.8 of the AI mania breakout is also right at that 430 area, right? So you get three Fibonacci perspectives all providing confluence around 430. Doesn't mean that the level needs to hold, but it would just you know reinstate the importance of that level and how the market wouldn't totally flip to a bearish tone on the higher time frames like the weekly if we're above 430 from multiple perspectives, right? Let's take those off and flip on our volume profile, see what's going on from this perspective. Of course, we have have not held this retest, right? That's what we were looking at last week. This high volume node was offering, uh, or the potential to offer a little bit of support there at the 444 level. We sliced right through it like a hot knife through butter, and obviously we've closed underneath. Now this, it's very nuanced, but there is a small little blip of volume here. You might not be able to see it on your screen unless I zoom in, so let me do that now. You can see this pokes out before the deeper low volume void comes into play, and this low, that little jut that I'm referring to, is basically the soft low that we're sitting on as of right now. It's right here, right? So if this breaks, that's where the risk to rotate through the low volume void comes into play, and we get closer to that all-important level, 418, 420, the magic zone that we've been discussing from the now monthly time frame chart for a couple of weeks in a row. So overall, the weekly is still healthy in terms of pullback. It really boils down to whether or not these soft lows are going to hold here around 430. Then the threat becomes the head and shoulders. If we produce the equal high, that threat is off the table. If we break on down, 420 is the key zone that you should start to think about.
On the daily time frame chart, let's first evaluate the expected move. If you're not familiar with this study, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner. If we're contained by the upper bound, the number is 444.50, and that, of course, just continues to produce lower highs in the grand scheme of the trend. And if we're contained by the lower bound, the number is 428.50, and that would be a continuation lower low of this overall move. So expected move is definitely bearish. I would also point out that the upper bound of the expected move is confluence with our daily 50 SMA and a back test of what is now going to act as overhead supply. So it's very likely if the market does try to rally here for an hourly counter trend style move, there's an opportunity for a big daily lower high there that sets up the rejection. And you can start to see how this would build out your weekly head and shoulders pattern that we were just referring to. The other reason why this is so important is because it was the structure from the prior breakout in the past. We know that there was a gap from the prior CPI cycle. We attempted to go gap fill reversal, no dice on the follow through move from in there. And and we also know if we take out our Fibonacci's from the last lower high or excuse me, higher low to the top, it was the 61.8 Fibonacci. So now like, it was a very important area to be watching as support. Now we flip the script that we're below it, right? What was once support can now act as resistance. It's very, very real that this could be a high probability outcome as the next key structure to be paying attention to for your daily lower high and the best possible short location, right? If we could get a rally up into this area and then produce some sort of inverted hammer, some sort of hourly double top, some sort of head and shoulders, something up here that would indicate a reversal. You have tight risk reward with a stop just above those patterns, short under underneath the lows of the patterns, and then you're targeting the equal low. That's optimistic if we rally first. It is kind of, you know, in the in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, there's an opportunity for a rally here just because of how extended and oversold we were last week. Doesn't mean that the market must rally, but to some degree, the odds would favor if there's gonna be some sort of rotation, some sort of breather for the market, that would result in a counter trend move. Uh, what else could I tell you here on the daily time frame chart? If we bring out the Fibonacci's now actually from the high down to the low, so instead of coming from this, this to this instead from the high down to the low, lo and behold, the 38.2 is kind of confluence around that zone as well. And you know, Fibonacci's work in either direction. We'll point them out when they're bullish, we'll point them out when they're bearish. And certainly staying underneath your 38.2 would produce daily bear flag consolidation, or once again, some sort of head and shoulders pattern on a higher time frame like the weekly. Let's move on down to the hourly time frame chart now that we understand that yes, obviously the context here is bearish, but clearly we want better location for a short entry. If we take a closer look, obviously this overhead supply has broken down. This is that key lower high zone that we were just talking about, 444. 445 is technically the level I would use based on the lower high from Tuesday intraday. Let's see what the anchored view apps have to say about this. Let's throw those on for our intraday. There we go. And these would sort of agree with a couple of points that I'm about to make here. Number one is that if we do continue to consolidate in this range, it's just bearish consolidation. I would not be overly bullish looking for a counter trend rally if we are under underneath 439.25. One of the reasons for that is that if you look at Friday specifically, it was a gap down, obviously a gap down after being incredibly oversold on the week. So not all that surprised that we saw a counter trend move, some inventory correction, right? But if you look at the activity of every single hourly bar in here that attempts to get up and into the Thursday range, there's a whole lot of upper wicks going on, just indicating a lack of confidence on the buy side of the market through that structure, which we know is thin. I mean, this is a very thin structure breakdown on the Thursday afternoon session, you would have thought to yourself, okay, if there's not a lot of structure there, the buyer should have squeezed through that a little bit uh, more so with ease simply wasn't the case. So anything that's in here is really just bearish consolidation underneath 439.25, a stronger counter trend move to get the daily lower high that we were talking about really results from some sort of consolidation break and higher low over 439.25. That to me would kick off the counter trend on the hourly. I would start to think about once again, those rejections for a daily lower high around 444, 444, uh, 450 is the upper edge of the expected move and 445 comes from once again, that Tuesday morning session, lower high that definitively breaks down and stays underneath our overhead supply. In terms of just getting straight up downside continuation, if we go like, you know, range to breakdown, 432, your weekly soft lows are on the table. And that is the key level to be talking 
talking about based on everything we just discussed from the weekly perspective. Once again, I'm not really all that in favor of looking for new money shorts after the market has been sold off so aggressively. It feels like you're chasing the lows, and if there is this counter trend rally that starts to unfold, you don't want to be short in the hole with no place to clearly place a stop loss, right? I suppose if you're looking at 15 minute, five minute intraday structure, that's fine. Shorts underneath a descending view app, something of that nature. That's totally cool as a scalper, but for higher time frames like the hourly or even daily time frame chart, chasing this move in the downward direction right now seems fairly risky from a risk reward perspective. If we do just see straight up continuation, some lower targets I could give to you would be the lower bound of this week's expected move, 429.25. And then beyond that, we have 426.50. And that's going to do it. Let's take a look at some supporting evidence. Market internals are always exhibit A. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner. For the most part, this screen really speaks for itself. It's done so all week, really. Uh, you can look at the net volume outflows on the week, negative 643 million into the close on Friday, well underneath our negative 500 million read, which is what we would consider substantial. Most of the advanced decline line activity is beneath the zero line in this week's worth of trade, a little bit of acceptance above on the Friday session. However, the tick never lies, right? The tick never, ever lies. Look at the net positive build on Friday in relationship to the net negative build on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. This is a very weak counter trend inventory correction style move not strong new money buyers swooping in to quote buy the dip on the market. There's just no evidence of that based on the internal screen. The sellers did show up. We talked about this on Twitter on Tuesday, and it's just been sell, sell, sell ever since. The internal screen certainly would suggest that even if we do rally under these circumstances, we're still very much so looking for a lower high to be set on the daily time frame chart. Market profile is always exhibit B. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner. Overall, what's going on here this week from a value area and point of control perspective, value area is definitively drifting down throughout the entire duration of the week, as is the point of control on a day over day basis. However, if you look at Wednesday and onward, points of control were actually left high in the profile instead of migrating lower with the close. Now, this brings up two interesting key points. Number one is that why is price acceptable? It's not really taking place at the lows. And I would argue that it's really shorts get active in the morning session and then they get paid into the close. There's no reason for them to close out because they're content with their short positions, right? And this would also be an indication that because there is no more volume commitment at the lows, stronger by the dippers are just simply not showing up, right? So as we continue to drift lower, it doesn't really strike me as a big deal that the point of control is being left higher in the individual session as opposed to migrating lower with price. This will become an issue when and if we start to take out those points of controls from a squeeze perspective. The target here, of course, would be the extremely poor high from the Wednesday session. There's your counter trend move on the hourly time frame chart in the SPY, and this is the equivalent, basically, of 40, uh, 444 on the SPY, right? So if we do get some sort of counter trend rotation, looking for a repair of the poor high, and then we can set the daily lower high and look for the continuation move in the downward direction. This would also make sense, as we just noted, from a squeeze perspective up and over some of these virgin points of controls, right? They have not been tested. There's no give and take to this market. It's just been purely dominated by sell side activity, uh, which is clearly lower. The one thing that I would point out as well is on Friday, we did produce a spike into the close. A spike is a string of single prints into the 4 p.m. bell. So we can't really determine whether or not these prices are fair because the market simply closed at 4 p.m. There wasn't enough time left in the day to determine, okay, the auction will continue higher, it will reject, or we'll just go sideways for price acceptance. So spike rules will be in play early on on the Monday session as we move into the open. That would basically tell us if we open above the spike, it's the most bullish situation. We'll look for that retracement and the hourly counter trend move. If we open in the spike, you will learn something when you break the spike high or low. And if we open under the spike, then OK, all of these buyers into the close are underwater, basically, and we'll look for continuation of our overall trend. To give you the number here out of the ES, the spike base is at 43.88. And obviously, your high of day from Friday is the spike. Spike high at 43.97. We'll round up there uh, one extra tick. Jumping back on over to the platform to evaluate the weekly performance of our sectors reveals that the XLE for the energy sector led the pack here by being down the least, only down 0.94%. And don't get me wrong, there was no escaping the bloodbath out there this week, but it's kind of peculiar that it was followed up by the XLK, the tech sector, the heavyest weight risk on style sector, only down 1.06%. And pair that with the bottom of the barrel goes to the XLY consumer discretionary, also a heavier weight risk on style sector. That was down a whopping 35 
0.57%. So it begs the question, is this a true risk-off style rotation, or is it just full-blown correlation to the downside? Certainly looks like, as of right now, just correlation to the downside. So walking forward from here, as we talked about on Wednesday, the next thing to be thinking about is if we do see a counter-trend rotation or counter-trend rally, I should say, um, in the SPY to set a daily lower high at 444, you'll have more confidence in the lower high, to short it at least, if it's being led by utilities, healthcare, lightweight materials, right? If it's being led by consumer staples, more confidence in shorting a SPY daily lower high. If it's being led by the XLK, if it's being led by the XLF, XLC, XLY, our heavier weight risk on style sectors, you might think twice about shorting your daily lower high at 444 and wait for some sort of hourly pattern or hourly confirmation back in the downward direction, right? So that's the key component to watch as we navigate this upcoming week's worth of trade if we get a counter trend rally in the first place. Let's take a look at the structural charts here and evaluate what's taking place from that perspective. XLE for energy, building a block in the upward direction here that does look more bullish than bearish. Obviously, if energy breaks out up and over 90.30, and this is one of the components that leads to your S&P daily lower high because this is a lighter weight sector, I would certainly argue that would give you more confidence in shorting your SPY daily lower high. XLK, the tech sector, what's going on over here? Should we be more or less confident? Well, I mean, look at this. We certainly flushed the H pattern we talked about from the Wednesday session, right? We made the equal low down here. It's very possible that even if we do get a move in the upward direction, we stuff or struggle at least around this area for a daily lower high underneath 170.25, and that would keep the bears in control. It'd certainly build out more so a bear flag consolidation style look, and then breaking down underneath 163.25, looking left, incredibly thin structure. That rotation could happen sooner rather than later into 157.85. So this does not strike me as an overly bullish chart for our SPY. The only time I would have more confidence in a stronger SPY reversal, not just a counter trend rally, but a full reversal, would be if the XLK could really break higher low retest and confirm with the higher low there over 170.25. Based on our current location, seems like a bit of a stretch and a lower probability into the early stages of this upcoming week. Let's take a look at the healthcare sector. Second heaviest weight by market cap, but as we know, D for defensive. If it's going to turn into a double top, be patient, wait for the breakdown underneath 132.65. We've also got both key moving averages at that location. I would not be a new money short on the 100% retracement. I would wait for a lower high somewhere underneath 134. 75 and then look for the breakdown underneath towards 130.25 prior support from back down over here. If this does break and higher low in this area, that's fine, right? Because we know that this is a D for defensive sector. It's probably going to lead to or at least help the S&P produce a counter trend style move. But because it's D for defensive, I would still have more confidence in shorting your spy daily uh, lower high as opposed to it being led by, obviously, your XLK. We talked about that uh, higher low over the 170 level, right? XLU for utilities. This speaks to full-blown correlation to the downside, right? We already talked about this path in the past. We talked about the 100% retracement, lower high under 65. Look at the breakdown happening in here. I do think it's interesting that it's going sideways instead of continuing to break down into the end of last week. So walking forward out of the XLU, if we can break in higher low, back above 63.75, make the rotation to 65, and that's kind of what puts upward pressure on the S and P to produce your counter trend rally, then great. That's going to once again, give you more confidence in shorting your spy lower high, as opposed to it being led by the XLK, like we were just discussing. So I'm going to throw a lot of situations at you here as we're walking through the sectors. Hopefully I'm not losing anybody with that, but this is the dynamic you should really be paying attention to XLB for materials, really lightweight sector, but this as a prior range, we're back down inside of it. The lower high threat is underneath 82. That obviously would put downward pressure on your S and P. If we get a break in higher low above, really not all that meaningful because because it's such a lightweight sector. Next up, XLI, weekly higher low is possible over the 103 level for a break, retest, and continuation like that. But obviously into the early stages of this week, if we do see continued pullback, that will be downward pressure for the S&P in the first place. If we do rally, because once again, everything seems to be fairly oversold as of Friday's close. If we do get a little bit of a counter trend rally here, you would wanna see it reject underneath overhead supply at 108.15 for the bears to remain fully in control in the short term, at least. XLF for financials. This is where we've got to do a little bit of discussing, right? Because your weekly higher low, just like the XLI, is capable of being put in around 33.65. If that takes place, it's not the end of the world from the weekly perspective. However, if we do rally, it's not going to be easy. You have all of this overhead supply, which is going to potentially sell for a break even at 34.75. Think of it as like bull flag consolidation, right? That failed. Anyone who's a disappointed bull in here is still holding. If they want out for break even, they sell here, right? So strong opportunity for a daily lower high up against 34. 
34.75, but weekly high or low against 33.65. So that kind of puts us in no man's land in here. I suppose how I would use this for this upcoming week is if we do rally to test the 34.75, if we reject off of that, that bodes more so for your daily lower high out of the S&P as opposed to a full-blown reversal. If the XLF wants to get a higher low over 34.75, we might change our tone slightly in the S&P or at least need extra layers of confirmation for a downside move to continue with a daily lower high, right? Next up, XLP. Talk about defensives, just again, full-blown correlation to the downside. This is classically a D for defensive sector. We always talk about risk off in the XLY versus the XLP. And just look at the full-blown correlation to the downside here. Underneath this is overhead supply. Underneath this as of Friday's close as overhead supply. So the chart looks incredibly weak. Any daily lower high can be set underneath 74.70. And even if it does does rally and poke above because it is so classically D for defensive, it would still give me more confidence in the counter trend move in the SPY still only setting a daily lower high. So it doesn't really matter what the XLP does in the coming weeks worth of trade. If it rallies, sure, it'll be helpful for setting the counter trend rally. But because it's D for defensive, I wouldn't think that it would bode well for a stronger full blown reversal back to an uptrend in the SPY, right? Daily lower high would be ideal, though, underneath 7470. Let's take a look at the XLC for communications. Some more deterioration here. Because this is a heavier weight risk on style sector, I would argue that your lower high wants to be here to keep the SPY looking like a better short at some sort of rally towards 444 or 445. If it just continues to consolidate underneath our prior structure at 6555, that of course just speaks for itself. It's as bearish as it gets. Downside targets would be coming from down here at 6345. We'll update you on Wednesday if we need anything lower. Real estate, really lightweight sector. It's not gonna, you know, really make or break our market. It's at the bottom of this overall range. Wouldn't be surprised for a little bit of a counter trend move here, especially with the full blown 100% retracement. If rates do continue in the upward direction, which we'll look at the TNX in just a moment, then yeah, a little bit more drift to the downside would not be unreasonable out of real estate. Last but certainly not least, XLY. Lots of damage done to this chart for a number of reasons. We remember that Amazon kind of kept this in play, staying in the range. This was the Amazon earnings gap up. We were above the top in there, and it just it, it didn't really materialize, right? So obviously, with that strong move underneath this range, but also this range, your weekly high or low, is not so much in play anymore, which would have been here at 163.25. So strong daily lower highs are set anywhere underneath 167.25. And then, you know, you could even have the possibility for a daily lower high here, obviously, underneath 170.25. The only time to be more confident in a full-blown reversal situation out of your SPY as a whole is a higher low up here, which once again, based on location alone, looks fairly, you know, low probability into the early stages of this week. So in walking through the sectors, hopefully, Hopefully you have some back pocket situations to be thinking about in terms of who's leading, who's losing. Um, and if we're getting big lower highs in the risk on sectors, that would obviously mean that, yes, we are looking for our SPY daily lower high as well. If the lighter weight risk off sectors are really ripping in the upward direction, it doesn't, you know, we don't have to be as concerned with that as the main takeaway, which I really hope you're grasping from today's sector analysis. Here's the sector ratio grid. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner on how to set this one up. Overall, the full blown risk on look is gone. Obviously, the XLK is now underneath a descending 50 SMA. The XLF is really more so sideways than anything else. And we've got a neutral 50 SMA. The XLY is certainly producing a lower low after a lower high. It's got a neutral 50 SMA as well. And the XLC is back down at the 50 SMA, which is still mildly upsloping, but it's certainly not continuing its aggressive trend in the upward direction. So risk on is sort of gone right now, but it's not a full blown risk off look yet. We certainly do have the XLV perking up over a now neutral 50 SMA. But if we look more importantly at the XLP and the XLU ratios, these are still underneath descending 50 SMAs. The only thorn in the side is the energy sector moving in the upward direction. So the argument here is that we have more so a neutral risk appetite for the markets, not a full blown risk off style rotation, which pairs exactly with what we just described from a sector analysis, uh, you know, structure analysis as well over there. Let's take a look at the XLK versus the XLU. So risk on versus risk off, it's still just sideways, right? It's certainly neutralizing. We're not continuing the aggressive uptrend, but it's also not breaking down aggressively, which is a key component as to why we're possibly looking for a counter trend relief rally before just saying, okay, the market's going to hell in a handbasket. We could do the same thing with the XLY over the XLP. Once again, risk on versus risk off in terms of consumer spending. And this, it's 
it's definitely starting to become a little bit weaker than the ratio we were just looking at, utilities versus tech. You can see the head and shoulders, lower highs in place. We're kind of sitting on the equal low. So watching this very closely, if these things do start to break down, of course, we will change our tone accordingly and we'll say, great, we're getting more of a risk off rotation. We're just too neutral as of right now based on all of the evidence we have in hand. So it's not full blown risk off. It is neutral risk as of right now. How about our good friend, the dollar? It certainly made a couple of intraday higher lows over the 101 level on the look below and fail. But now with the equal high on the table here up against 103.50, deeper higher lows can be formed anywhere over 101. And ultimately, if something like that does take place, right, we get something that does this. If we pull back off of the equal high, 103.50, the little pullback here could result in the counter trend move out of equities down below. But when and if we breach the equal high for the full rotation to the top of the range, which is how a look below and fail should pan out, the target's always the top, 105.65, that continues to put downward pressure on equities in the lower pane down here. So watching that dynamic around 103.50 very closely into the coming week's worth of trade, I will point out that we do have a bit of an ascending triangle with continued higher lows on a bar to bar count here into the end of this week, suggesting that it might be likely for the breakout first before some sort of relief pullback out of the dollar, which could produce once again, your counter trend rotation or rally, I should say, out of S&P equities down below. If we take a look at the gold contract, is this confirming or denying the evidence that we're sort of putting forward out of the dollar? I would argue with the continued drift here and making a substantial lower low, whereas the dollars only produced an equal high. Yes, it's very likely that there's leeway for the dollar to continue in the upward direction there, especially if we pair that as well with what's going on in interest rates over here. I mean, we've just produced a equal high to the extreme high we had in 2022. And I need to share with you a perspective from a multi-year chart here. Let's go uh, monthly chart and max available data. You can look at more rate data on a different platform, but this will do for now. The main idea is that we've broken this multi-decade resistance trend line, and it's very possible that we have a paradigm shift on our hands where higher rates become sort of, quote, the new normal. I know that that term probably has a bad rap from what we experienced in the past, but with a bull flag consolidation look or even just like cups starting to form here, rounded bottom uh, from the mild pullback that we've got thus far throughout the early stages of 2023, you know, it's certainly reasonable that attempting these highs, we can see continuation in the upward direction. I would really encourage you to go check out some of the work from Chris over at Savaco Capital. Uh, he's put together great great presentations, how even if rates in the grand scheme of things do continue in the upward direc direction from a secular bull theory, we can see markets continue uh, higher. Now, it would take some readjusting. And I'm not saying that, again, even if rates go, quote, to the moon here, the market's not going to get beat up a little bit. It certainly will. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not really enough to derail the secular bull thesis. Once again, go check out Chris over at Shivako Capital. Uh, we are not affiliated in any way, but I do think he is doing great work on the subject. Let's take a look over at the inverted ZT, and this would just speak to expectations for the Fed. And I don't want to dive too deep into expectations because Jackson Hole is likely going to throw a wrench in any sort of analysis that we do here. However, it is forming an ascending triangle. It looks more likely than not that it wants to break up and over the top of that pattern, which would suggest that it's likely we will have one more rate hike uh, in the chamber, so to speak, into the end of this year. And that's counter to what the tracker tool is suggesting. So let's take a look at that now. So no changes in the tracker tool, still expecting a pause for the next meeting, which as we know is on September 20th, but these probabilities are very likely to shift around during the Jackson Hole Symposium, which kicks off on Thursday. One of the main topics that I think the Fed is likely going to have to address is the rapid acceleration of growth estimates out of GDP for quarter three. This is the Atlanta Fed, and you can just see how this has almost gone parabolic here in the expectations of what the result will be. And obviously with growth that looks like this, there's bound to see some sort of inflation and with inflation that's well above uh, our baseline that we need to hit for the Fed's quote 2% target, it's just, it doesn't seem like this is in alignment with what the Fed has been trying to achieve. Once again, it's not my job to say whether or not it's right, wrong, this, that, the other thing, but this is the fundamental dynamic that fundamentalists should be arguing. Great, GDP is continuing to rip in the upward direction. Growth is way better than anybody forecasted. Of course, inflation is going to rebound, right? That would be sort of the, the logical progression of that. And you could even 
take it one step further and look at a financial conditions chart, and this is not an end-all be-all, but financial conditions are loosening, which is the opposite of the Fed's goal of the rate hiking campaign, right? They're trying to tighten financial conditions uh, and sort of restrict things so inflation does not run higher than their target of once again 2%. Let's take a look at the calendar for this week. It's jam-packed. We get this very interesting BRICS summit. We talked about this in the live stream a couple of times. Maybe some interesting comments come from China, but the whole basket of currencies there is rapidly losing value against the dollar. I'm not really sure or certain why anybody would want to transact in that as a new uh, you know, global standard. We do get flash uh, manufacturing and services PMIs on Wednesday at 945, so just after the open. Keep your wits about you for some volatility there. Unemployment claims, as always, on Thursday, but most importantly, Thursday kicks off our Jackson Hole Symposium, where Powell will likely have to once again address some of the sort of concerns about rapidly accelerating growth. Is inflation going to rebound? All of these different dynamics. The labor market, right? So far, last week's unemployment claims, they came in at the expectations, right? You can see 239 uh, versus 240 was the expectation. The previous week actually got revised in the upward direction by the tune of 2000. So once again, that labor market continues to be a little bit hairy in terms of what the data is coming out as. It's like everything gets revised in the upward direction, but we shall see. These are all things that Powell will have to address in the symposium, and I do think that the market will react according to some of his comments. We all know what took place in last year's meeting. Let's take a look at the earnings calendar. Really, it's just NVIDIA after the close on Wednesday. That is going to be all eyes on NVIDIA. Really big expectations that they've set for themselves. If they come in underneath those expectations, expect the market to not like it one bit, and we probably fall off aggressively unless they promise that, hey, just kidding, AI, AI, AI. They say it, you know, the magic 50 times, the stock will rally 50%, and then they push it out to next quarter. So very interested in NVIDIA earnings after the close. I will not be swing trading anything through that. I will never, ever swing trade anything through earnings like that, but it's an all eyes on moment, really make or break for our market paired with the Jackson Hole Symposium. How about the market's appetite for risk? You'll notice that the TLT ratio to the S&P is continuing to go sideways here instead of continuing its downtrend, moving in the downward direction, but it is underneath a resistance trend line. So it's not a full-blown flight to safety yet until we can breach that resistance trend line. And even at that, with the paradigm shift that we just talked about over on the TNX with rates, you know, moving aggressively higher and being the new normal, this and the 60-40 portfolio might not actually be effective. So we can look at some different metrics to determine whether or not there's still uncertainty out there in the market. And I would argue yes is the answer to that. If we look at bonds in relationship to one another, short duration versus long duration, seeing this elevated speaks to you know uncertainty in the long-term approach uh, to that, right? People are favoring the shorter end of the curve, not wanting to go further out in time when the yield is better there. We could also take it a step further and look at credit spreads. We've been looking at just the LQ uh, versus the IEF in prior videos, but I've added the HYG versus the SHY. That's just a shorter uh, you know, duration of the same exact kind of relationship. And there's subtle shifts, right? Subtle shifts in the upward direction. Now, don't get me wrong. It's nothing like what we had over here and over here, but everything's got to start somewhere. And with these moving higher, credit spreads expanding, basically widening, that would speak to, right, this moving in the downward direction it makes sense, right? The, the risk premium is not there. Why would you accept more risk in corporate bonds versus going with government backed in short duration, right? So seeing that is kind of interesting and once again speaks to an understanding that, okay, it would kind of make sense as to why equities are not being all that favored right now uh, with the credit spread uh, sort of widening over here. Let's take a look at just the HYG in isolation. And you can see that this is all over the place. There's been this interesting divergence that was happening over here. Now we finally have a lower low, but this is much more of an aggressive lower low, but you can come back to here and say that, okay, this is a higher low from here to here, but then you can go back to here and say, okay, this is an equal low. And now we're just slightly higher, and this is kind of in sync. So HYG in isolation, not really all that helpful in my eyes as of right now. Continuing to monitor for shorter term uh, divergences like this one was fairly interesting. It didn't pan out. Obviously, equities won that battle, but continuing to watch for things like that, not so much the uh, the longer duration stuff as of right now. Bitcoin, everybody's freaking out about Bitcoin. Starlink, or excuse me, uh, Starlink, uh, SpaceX dumping some of their Bitcoin holdings. I mean, in reality, we've just undone this move in here. It's still sitting high high and tight in this 
as an overall trend with higher lows. Sure, there's a very nuanced higher high in here, but we've gone sideways for so long, it's no surprise that after a long period of consolidation, you're going to see some sort of expansion. I think it's fairly overblown at this point, but the fact that it is moving in the downward direction would speak to risk appetite deteriorating overall. So this is not divergent, and it actually does speak to all of the same talking points we've just walked through with the TLT, credit spreads, short duration bonds, all that stuff. It is actually coming to fruition here in crypto as well. Risk appetite is decreasing. And how about the market breadth? New highs versus lows closing underneath the zero line as of Friday. That is starting to show some cracks in the armor. SPX A200R also making the rotation to the 50% mark. If this is going to remain a healthy pullback, this key component needs to stay over 50%. Let's take a look at the SPX A50R on a daily time frame chart. This is aggressively underneath the 50% mark. What does this one mean? Because this is a little bit more actionable in the early stages of this week. If we do see a counter trend relief rally, noting that your SPX A50R stays underneath the 50% mark would give you more confidence that yes, you can go out there and short the lower high in the S&P. If it just screams right back up through it and gets into Goldilocks zone, a little bit more skeptical of your daily low or high situation, we would have to reevaluate, but there have been some substantial deteriorations in market breadth in the last week's worth of trade. Let's take a look at the equal weight S&P 500, no hold at the 150. And once again, just like everything else, if this is going to produce a lower high, it wants to remain underneath 150 at this point in time to bode well with and pair nicely with the daily lower high situation in the S&P over here. If equal weight really breaks up and over 150 with a higher low, begs the question, why is there not a more substantial reversal out of the S&P weighted underneath. Let's take a look at the Dow. Is there any divergences going on over here? The answer is simply no. This is saying, hey, everything's fine and dandy. No divergences. Nothing's overblown. The sell makes sense. And volatility. You can see that the VIX is still elevated up and over the 15 handle and also towards the top of this as an overall range. But as we know, we've really got to look behind the curtain with zero DTEs kind of throwing things off. The VIX itself has a look above and fail on the 103 level. So if volatility is going to continue to creep into this market, the VIX needs to get up and over 103. We know that this is always the precursor. Why do I bring this up? Because if the VIX spends more time underneath 103, hovering back down towards these lows around 90, that would give the opportunity for a counter trend rally in the S&P. And then we would look for it to spike once again, as we're setting a potential daily lower high. So watching this 103 level in the VIX very closely into the early stages of this upcoming week, let's take a look at VIX futures. We did update the contracts over here. And you can see that we're moving closer to a backwardation. We're not there yet. We're still underneath the zero line, but the trend is up with lows, higher lows, highs and higher highs. So watching that nine versus 30 day VIX is still surprising but it's not at the lows. It's certainly hovering close to the zero line, not all the way in backwardation yet, but once again, more so some early signs of discomfort, right? And the one day VIX, I think that this is something that we can start tracking. I'm gonna be really impressed if this works out, but if we can break this support trend line early on in the week and the one day VIX can come back down towards the 750 handle, that would, in my eyes, speak to some sort of counter trend rally unfolding. And that would be how we use the one day VIX going forward. When we get a big string of higher lows, it indicates volatility heating up in the market. When it breaks, it sort of allows for that relief. So watching that as a technical indication, the data set has not formed all the way yet, but something to keep tabs on. QQQ weekly time frame chart. What do we see from a candle structure and location perspective? Extremely similar to our S&P. Solid red bodied bar, a little bit of an upper and lower wick, but nothing substantial in relationship to the size of the overall body. And we have closed fairly weak in the lower third of the trading range. On the bar to bar count, we do have ourselves a lower high as well as a lower low. And we've closed more so at the bottom at the soft lows instead of above the soft lows like the SPY. So that would give me a little bit more of a bearish edge, bearish tone over here in the QQQ. Obviously the threat for a head and shoulders would look something like this going forward into the future, the top of that range, roughly around 370. We'll see that level on the daily chart in just a moment here. Uh, what else? Anchored view apps. What do we see from that perspective? If we throw on the QQQ anchored view apps, AI mania anchored view app did not hold. And once again, this key zone is, it's really all eyes on 
360, 358. We'll see that in just a moment again on the daily time frame chart. We could do the same thing with our Fibonacci's that we did on the S&P. If we come in from the all-time high to the October low, then we come from the low of this rally up to the top. You can see there's your confluence with the 38.2. And if we come in with this one from here to here, you also get the 61.8. So 61.8, 38.2, 61.8, all eyes on as a next level. 350, 350 to the downside out of the QQQ. If it takes a couple of weeks to get there, you might also see this anchored view up slowly produce confluence of support, depending on the speed in which, again, we make it towards that area. We could take a look at the volume profile to see what else we can learn about the QQQ from this perspective. We did not hold this as a high volume node. So you could think of this as overhead supply, right? As we fall through the low volume void, the next major support is here, which is closer to 340. So we've got 350 and 340 as major downside supports from the weekly perspective on the QQQ. It's still very likely that the Qs, again, it goes without saying, but lows, higher lows, higher lows, higher lows. We could find higher lows, honestly, anywhere over 320. You could argue that they're monthly higher lows at that point. But if 350 holds, if 340 holds, the weekly uptrend is still very much so intact, pulling back from a higher high in the overall trend sequence. The stronger reversal would come out of that head and shoulders because then we would have a weekly lower high, right? So that's that's the possibility for a stronger trend reversal on the higher time frame like the weekly. Let's move on down to the daily time frame chart here and see what else we can learn about the QQQ into the early stages of this week. Let's first evaluate the expected move. There it is. If we're contained by the upper bound, the number is 366.87. That, of course, is just just a big time daily lower high. If we're contained by the lower bound, 349.45, that is a continuation lower low. Expected move is bearish from that perspective. Same kind of concept here with the upper edge also confluence with overhead supply. I would argue that the key zone here on the QQQ is more so 364.75 coming from this prior level as well. Um, nothing really from a pattern perspective. Same concept with the gap fill and struggling intraday. Let's move on down to the hourly time frame chart here and see what else we can learn. Uh, again, actually, before we go to the hourly, my apologies. If the weekly head and shoulders is going to form, right? We talked about 372. There's your lower high on the weekly. There's the head and shoulders, right? We, we talked about this is the weekly balance range. These are the soft lows, right? That's that whole concept in here. Now let's go back to the hourly time frame chart throw on the anchored view apps and see what we can learn from this perspective. Once again, very similar commentary to what we just discussed out of the S&Ps. Your key lower high on any counter trend rally is going to be 364.75. So anything that's consolidating in here is still bearish, you know, breaking down under 358 downside targets would be 353.50. Then the lower edge of this week's expected move at 349 roughly. If we do get some sort of consolidation to a break, you would need a higher low over 361. And then your counter trend rally brings you to again, 364.75. When and if we get here, we are looking for any excuse to go short on a daily lower high. It could be a very simple daily inverted hammer. It could be an hourly double top. It could be a head and shoulders, all the same patterns that we just discussed over in the S&P. For a stronger reversal to actually unfold, we need a higher low over that area. You need some sort of big break and higher low to recapture the bottom of what is now overhead supply. It's really, you know, again, that strikes me as a low probability considering all of the data points that we've just discussed in the S&P walkthrough. Obviously, tech being the heaviest weighted component of the S&P, also being very sensitive to interest rates, doesn't really seem highly probable that this is a strong possibility early on in the coming weeks worth of trade. We'll change our tone if we have to, but as of right now, still in the camp of looking for better location for a lower high to short into out of the NASDAQ. We could take a look at the internals for the NASDAQ side of things, and everything's extremely similar. Strong outflows, negative 850 on the uh, read there, negative 600 is the threshold. Threshold, most of the time being spent in trend lower zone or underneath the zero line. Cumulative builds really speak for themselves, and we don't even have a positive build on Friday, whereas the S&P did. So once again, a very mild sort of counter trend move, no stronger indications of buyers whatsoever on Friday's session. Let's take a look at the market profile. Same concepts here. However, the points of control are definitely more so in the midpoint of the ranges as opposed to towards those highs. So I think there's the opportunity for a counter trend move to produce more of a squeeze sooner rather than later. Just noting that if shorts were positioning in this area where uh, the bulk of the value uh, and volume was being transacted, right? If we get above that, that's where your stronger counter trend unfolds. Your poor high from the Wednesday session is at 15140 on the NASDAQ futures. And that would roughly be the equivalent of your lower high zone around 367.65 on the QQQ. That would be right around in here. There's Wednesday's highs. Uh, oops, right around in there. That's Wednesday's highs, right? So this zone, very, very interesting for your 
your lower high situation to short into and look for daily trend continuation in the downward direction. IWM Rusty, what's going on with small caps over here? Certainly a solid red bodied bar, but a little bit more of a substantial lower wick as compared to the other weekly bars we've been evaluating with no upper wick to speak of. Doesn't really strike me as a bullish indication, but just a difference between the indexes as of right now. From a location perspective on the bar to bar count, big time lower high as well as a major lower low was produced and perhaps most interestingly, we are just in the midpoint of this as an overall weekly balance range. There's really nothing to write home about about IWM doing anything substantial, as we know, until we can exceed 200 or fall underneath roughly 165 and being tangled up in the midpoint at the major moving averages on the weekly, not holding up for a higher low off of the top of the prior range over here. We could throw on the anchored view apps as well. You know, no retest hold on the anchored view app. That's your all time high anchored view app right off of the low from October anchored view app right in the midpoint of that band really just massively almost disappointed to be quite frank with you out of the small caps over here this was looking a little bit promising like hey we're going to continue to get this stair-stepping activity here uh, from a technical perspective right it had all the ingredients to potentially hold there as support 188 no dice so let's continue on down to a daily actually we'll go with the uh, let's go volume profile first just to illustrate that we still have this incredibly strong base around that 165 170 ish level we were just talking about as the bottom of this as the overall range this high volume node is literally what we've closed on. So you don't really want to initiate a trade at a high volume node. You want to use that as a target. Your upper high volume nodes are right towards the top around 200. So very, very neutral on the IWM weekly time frame chart now falling back down into the midpoint of this as an overall range, fairly disappointing from the subtle improvements that were trying to take place uh, in the past couple of weeks, really. Let's go back on down to the daily time frame here and we'll throw our levels on. Everything's going to hinge upon that 188.25 level, the previous uh, breakout level, which we in a picture perfect world would have found a weekly higher low above, obviously, now that we're underneath it, and it's the upper bound of this week's expected move, the expectation is that okay, we get something that does this and there's a daily head and shoulders, we reverse back down to the bottom of the range, closer to that 170 high volume node over time, not this week over time, right? This was perhaps the most aggressively oversold uh, index into the end of last week, notice how far underneath from the expected move we were. So it wouldn't be all that surprising to see more so a counter trend rally out of IWM, a little bit of a reprieve. It's certainly not going to adjust our daily downtrend that has the opportunity to form here with a lower high. I mean, ideally, or I shouldn't say ideally, ideally the lower high is 188.25, but from a technical perspective, anything that's underneath, uh, even I hate to say it, but like way up here on 195 is a daily lower high. We never, we've never seen an hourly uptrend in any of this for a counter trend sort of relief bounce, right? So all things considered, you know, really, really brutal chart over here in small caps, just getting right back down into the center of that prior range. In terms of 100% retracement, once again, very difficult to be a new money short down here. Ideally, you want to look for something that does this, puts in a lower high, equal low flush. If you you can pick off the top up here because you're a quick draw McGraw or you're just an intraday trader. Fantastic. That also makes sense. If you come in from here to here, top of the move to the bottom of the move, where's your 38.2? Once again, confluence with 188.25. This is your key watch. If there's a counter trend move, this is where you want to see the seller step back up in the small caps. Let's take a look at the hourly time frame chart. Not much else to glean from this. Everything is falling off of a cliff. Friday was a little bit stronger. Um, as we noted in the S&P upper wicks, the QQQ was the same thing. I didn't comment on it, but it does have upper wicks uh, suggesting some struggle after the gap close. Not so much the case here out of IWM. You can see high and tight consolidation into the afternoon. This would strike me as a short squeeze. We'll also see that in the market profile as a P-shaped profile in just a moment here. So going forward, what's the game plan out of small caps? As a general indication for broad markets, it would certainly be helpful for the counter trend uh, relief rally we've been discussing. If IWM wants to make that rotation towards 188.25, that will happen as long, or I shouldn't say it will happen, but it's more likely likely to happen if we are getting continued price acceptance above 184.50. If we slip back down underneath, once again, I'm not really an advocate for shorting the equal low down here. You would need to see it build out via time, some sort of bear flag consolidation, then flush after some sort of definitive period has gone by, not just chasing the lower low and lower low and lower low. Your trade location would just be terrible in that sense. Let's take a look at some anchored view apps for our IWM. 
And again, confluence of resistance here at 188.25. Over time, depending on how long this potential rotation takes place, these will slowly drift lower. I don't know exactly when they'll be there, but it's something to pay attention to uh, overall, just because we are underneath the band of anchored view apps. It does speak to the bears being in full-blown control. On downside continuation, 180.75, and we've got a daily gap to close back here towards the bottom of our range. 177.50 closes, 176.25. Let's take a look at the internals for the Russell side of things. Again, substantial outflows, more time spent underneath the zero line in trend lower zone here. Cumulative ticks really speak for themselves. And Friday, once again, is nothing more than just a bit of a squeeze. It is not sustained buying pressure based on our cumulative build. We could take a look at the market profile. There's your P-shape. There is the point of control and value area higher in the profile. So once again, that's why I was saying if we are above that 184, ooh, what was it? I'm blanking on the number. If we're above that 184.50 level, it, there's higher odds that you get some continued squeeze up for that back test of 188.25. And that would really come from, again, value area and point of control being higher on the Friday session as opposed to lower or even middled in the overall profile. You can see that the squeeze, again, this dynamic totally makes sense. And this is a great example. I'm glad we're covering it in IWM. Russell, when the point of control does shift lower, and we get above those points of control, that's where the squeeze really starts to take place, right? So this is a threat as well with the point of control being floored on the Wednesday low as well. We do have a poor high out of IWM on the uh, Friday session. So taking out that high would, in my opinion, kick off a continuation of the squeeze in the upward direction. Watching that very closely, we know the level in the IWM, but in our futures, it will be 1871, 1872. Let's round up there, 1872. If you've made it to this point in the video, I appreciate you coming out to the show. I spent all day yesterday at Killington doing some downhill mountain biking. It was an absolute blast. It's a good reminder to get away from the screens, get up into the mountains, and just enjoy some outdoors. So I hope you were able to do the same this weekend. Let's kick things off here on Apple. Bear Flag Breakdown has you know, ultimately unfolded after the earnings gap down here with some continuation into the Thursday and Friday sessions. We closed our prior gap and now we're starting to see a little bit of a rotation back into the Thursday range. The only time to be more aggressive on the long side out of Apple is on a daily higher low over 179.75. It's a bit of a stretch into the early stages of this upcoming week. However, on the hourly time frame chart, it's quite clear that you can get a bit of a squeeze up and over 175 to get that rotation into 176 and then you can look for your daily lower high, right? If you get something that does this on the hourly, double top, head and shoulders, the whole nine yards, if we get a rejection off of 177, that would make sense for continuation in the downward direction. And then I would be neutral if we poke up into and get acceptance inside of this range, as we just talked about on the daily, requires a higher low above the top of that range to start squeezing through some of the earnings and then continuation style structure over here. To the downside, if we reject off of 177 and do see substantial follow through over here, let's go back to the daily, your targets would come in at these big equal lows, 170, 40. And then this is technically a gap over here under 170, 40 closes closer to 166, 70. Let's take a look at Netflix still on a daily time frame chart over here. There is your daily time frame head and shoulders breakdown underneath the neckline at 415. And we're coming into previous support from back here. Let's drop it down to an hourly. And once again, you could make the argument that it's very difficult to be a new money short after we've broken down from range one, gotten fall through underneath a support trend line in there. You don't want to be short in the hole. So where's your next major lower high? It's on a retest of that daily neckline at 415. I would be looking for shorting opportunities here if we can see a counter trend rally in the upward direction. If we just consolidate underneath 406.75, You'd probably wait for this to turn into an hourly bear flag and then look for the breakdown underneath 397.75, some downside targets, 390.50, and then 382.75. Let's take a look at Tesla. What's going on with the daily time frame chart first? Definitely breaking down through thin structure. There's really not much going on in this segment of the chart, and it's just continuing to drift lower and lower and lower. Once again, being short in the hole down here, probably not my first thought, right? You really don't want to be a new money short after this move has already unfolded out of this as a balance range out of this as a balance range. So what's the game plan? Tesla is going to be a day-to-day -day style situation. If we can take out the top of Friday's range, great. Maybe we'll look for a counter trend rotation, 227, then look to trade in the downward direction on a lower high off of that level. If we break through the bottom of Friday's range underneath 213, if you can get an intraday lower high and define your risk and stick to that, meaning you are a disciplined trader, you stick to that risk, then it's not that you can't short it down here, but just be aware that a counter trend snapback could be a sort of rip your face off off style rally, noting that you're likely going to be one of the shorts caught off sides, right? If you get caught off sides here and you start closing out, you provide more buying pressure. And that's where those really 
face rip and counter trend rallies come from. So that's interesting there. If we do get the you know lower high and continuation, your next downside target, 203.85 out of Tesla early on in the week. Google L, what's going on over here? Some price acceptance finally in the gap. Um, so I will say that bears are making a stand here, finally starting to get something going on. So what's the idea? As long as we're underneath 127.65, bear flag consolidation looking for the gap to continue to fill underneath 126.25 coming from the top end of prior structure back here. So if we're under 127.65, I would no longer have the bull bias that we have had ever since it was in this range for the multiple look belows and fail on this as an intermediate range. So underneath here, more of a neutral to bear tone, breaking down from a bear flag, of course, looking to trade for some downside outcomes. 125 is going to start to pair nicely with your daily 50 SMA. That's the blue line on the screen. Full gap close is 123. If we break the top of this, I wouldn't really be looking for new money longs over 127.65. It would have to be a higher low over 129.10. Next up, Metaverse. What's going on with Zuckerberg's fantasy land? Let's back it out to a daily time frame chart first. And you can see that we have broken down substantially. There is no higher low from here to here on the daily time frame chart. As a matter of fact, we have a big time lower low. You once again probably don't want to be short in the hole at the bottom of the overall move and instead want to position with more respectful structure. Uh, you know, maybe if something, I would actually be interested in this level here at 288.75. If we can put in some intraday rejections and start to roll over, you build out an H pattern perhaps on the, actually before we go to the hourly, let me just show you prior structure, right? Support and then support. Those are your downside targets, 269.75, 260.50. Let's go to the hourly now. And what I was getting at is if you can produce some sort of like hourly H pattern like this, break the equal low, that's where those downside targets could be in play. Uh, what you don't want to see happen is obviously this turn into a double bottom, in which case the long is on a higher low with acceptance over 288.75. So it's useful to just identify if you're trying to go short, you don't want that to happen. Okay, so if you're trying to go long, you need the higher low over 288.75. Notice the gap fill reversal into the end of day, uh, really harsh rejection. There's just no, no desire from the buyers at all to poke up and into Thursday's range. It does look more so like a, again, counter trend inventory correction, nothing major in terms of buyers really aggressively stepping up out of meta. Let's take a look at NVIDIA. NVIDIA earnings on Wednesday after the close. So keep your wits about you on this one. Really wide range has formed up here after that sort of interesting rally from Monday's session. Hammer and right in the midpoint of that as kind of a balance, right? Right at the daily 50 SMA, 433.50 is the number. If we rotate to the equal high, it's 454 anything beyond that, you can walk up some targets. I'm really not thrilled with trading this one. I'm just going to be fully transparent with you. I'm, I'm, I'm not interested really in getting caught up in the elevated implied volatility out of NVIDIA, especially at this price point. It just doesn't make sense. Your contracts, you know, you really have to see an outsized move for them to generate any sort of return for you. So I'm going to be on the sidelines and kind of wait for this one to, de to determine a direction for the broad market in terms of the massive expectations that lots of folks have of NVIDIA earnings here. If I drop it down to the hourly, just to give you a rough sense of that pivot point. Once again, that daily level, 433.50, we just saw it, daily 50 SMA. It makes complete sense, right? There's some intraday rejections. That's where we stalled out on the Monday rally. Support, support, support when broken, starting to act as resistance into the end of day on Friday. So if you're a bear, what you want to see is this to continue to act as a lower high price acceptance underneath. And we continue to flush through the thin structure of Monday's breakout to retest 407. That would be the early week short. The early week long would be some sort of higher low structure that then confirms 433.50 as a higher low after a break, right? Next up, Microsoft, what's going on with Softy? Taking a look at the daily time frame chart. These daily charts are becoming useful just so we can look back at prior structure and understand where support is coming in. So, I mean, total like double top from here, there's a neckline. We're underneath it, rejections underneath. Um, nothing about this chart is overly indicative of stronger buy sides stepping up here. I would be interested to see what the reaction is on a little bit further continuation to see how buyers respond to this prior congestion. Are they going to defend that area or not. So to get there, again, you don't want to be short in the hole, but continued price acceptance under 319.75, looking for that drift to continue lower. If we get acceptance above, it's a stronger retest of that double top neckline at 326.75. If we go to an hourly time frame chart, right, we never actually flipped into an hourly uptrend to get there. So hourly uptrend to get there, there's a daily lower high, then we look for the reversal off of the retest of the double top neckline, right? Next up is going to be Amazon. Last but certainly not least, we've got the mini beast daily time frame chart moving back into prior congestion, failing to hold the earnings gap up. Most of the gap has closed, catching a little bit of support here at the daily 50 SMA. Uh, so that is fairly interesting to me. If you take a look at the hourly charts, once again, 
you know, short in the hole probably wouldn't be my first choice. Uh, instead, looking for this type of idea and then a rejection here off of 137 gets really interesting or just consolidation to that and lead to a breakdown of a range to close the gap, right? It's, it's kind of one or the other, but I wouldn't really be chasing new money shorts now that the breakdown for the most part has closed the majority of the gap. We have the daily 50 SMA and we also have prior structure. If I just scrunch this up, you can see all this prior resistance is right on par with that 131 level in here. So overall, the message of today's video is, yeah, we're definitely bearish on this market as we walk forward based on a substantial amount of deterioration, but make sure you have a tactful entry point before just getting short. Two trade ideas, and then you are on your way for the evening. First up is PFE for Pfizer, and you can see a couple of trend lines on the chart, but more importantly, an inside bar slash three bar-ish style play up against the 50 SMA after a trend line break into the Friday session. Obviously, there's some relative strength here as well in the upward direction. It outperformed on the week. If that's going to continue to be the case, first target is probably the equal high in here. Just to give you a number, uh, that would be around 37.50. So the range isn't all that attractive out of Pfizer, but we are looking for upside here. If you want to trade it with shares, it's at a cheap enough price point where you could likely do so. I'm not entirely familiar with the options chain out of this one, but the main idea is that this turns into bull flag break. And then, you know, after a trend line break from here, we're kind of already starting to reverse some of the downtrend, right? Target once again, 3757. Then beyond that would be the downward sloping resistance trend line from there. You already have a daily higher low in place. If this is a double bottom, right? This is your neckline. Friday's consolidation was above that. This is in play as long as we're over 36.29 out of PFE. Next up is COP, ConocoPhillips. What's going on with this one? Energy sector, a little bit of relative strength there as we saw from a sector distribution as well as ratio. So if we can break this as a bull flag, we've got the flat top over 118. The target becomes this prior gap. We've got really thin structure through the breakdown. Just kind of makes sense. Once again, these two things having some sort of relative strength behind them. The patterns make sense. We're breaking trend. There's a clear level to get involved around risk reward can remain tight once again 118 is the breakout point here in conoco phillips gap close 121 41 up to 122 41 that is going to conclude today's episode of the weekly watch list if you enjoyed the video or learned anything new let me know down below in the comment section or by giving the video a simple thumbs up i hope to see you all on monday morning bright and early at 8 15 for our pre-market prep and with that said i wish you a green trading week